Coming up next, I'll be in conversation with Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. I'll ask him about you-know-who. That's Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Coming up next... This is Alan Chartuck, and I'm delighted, and I mean delighted, to be in conversation today with Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science and International Relations at SUNY New Paltz, where he teaches political theory. He joins us today to talk about his book, Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Professor Miller received his Ph.D. in government from the University of Virginia in 1996, where he also holds a master's degree, a B.A. in politics from the University of California at Santa Cruz. Professor Miller worked as a congressional and state senate aide in California. He lives in Rosendale, New York, with his partner Sarah and their daughter Cleo. Welcome, Professor Miller. Well, thanks very much for having me. I appreciate you uh, taking the time to talk to me about this today. Well, your book arrived on my desk, and I said, I've got to talk to this guy. Why? Well, I could talk to him because I find his subject fascinating, or I could talk to him because he's a teacher at New Paltz, and I love New Paltz. I really do. I was there for many, many years, and I consider it to be a superb choice that any parent could send their kid to. In fact, what is it? An hour and a half from New York and an hour and a half from Albany, something like that. So it's... Dead set in the middle. Yeah, it's right there in the middle, and it's a great little town. In fact, it's a town where students come, and they go to school, and then, Jeff, they never leave. <laughs> Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes now, when did you stop teaching here? When did you move up to Albany? I, I, I have, I, I have, I have no spatial sense whatsoever. I can't. <laughs> I couldn't even tell you when I came and when I went, and it's getting worse. Because but, I got here in 1999, and you were, you were, I think, recently gone at that point. Yeah. Maybe six or seven years. I can't, I can't remember exactly what it was. But well, well what happened was I was teaching at New Paltz. And along came a guy, long deceased now, named Cushman. And he walked into my office from the communications department at SUNY Albany, and he said, I'm going to double your salary. (laughs) I said, what? Oh. (laughs) So anyway, he recruited me, and there was a certain amount of hell to pay between Albany and New Paltz. Not that you want to hear all of this, and I don't blame you. But what ended up happening was they went to the chancellor, And I used to work out with that chancellor at the Stu Ben Club in Albany. And he said, I'm always trying to get you guys to do things together. So make them joint professor in both places. And that's how it happened. And by the way, that did it. And by the way, give them the money. And and one of the reasons that it was so important that I keep New Paltz in my portfolio, no matter how this sounds, is because I would have lost the Legislative Gazette project if I just moved to Albany. So it really worked out very well. And that's the last interview of myself question I'm going to ask you. So, that Legislative Gazette program is such a benefit for our students. You know, thank you for doing that. That is really fabulous. Our kids go up there and they have a great time. Lots of good experience. Isn't um, that... not More communication students than poli-sci students. I try to encourage the poli-sci students to do it, but mostly communication students. And by the way, Jeff, that's always been the case. It's always been the case that the communications kids, as opposed to the political science students, were in greater numbers, although we always got some political science But let's start with you. Tell us more about yourself and how you ended up teaching political theory. Wow. Oh, boy, that's a big question. Well, as you said, I live in Rosendale, New York, a little bit north of uh, New Paltz, if you don't know it. I know it well. I I know it well. My band, the Berkshire Ramblers, has actually played in the Rosendale Cafe. I am. Mark Morgenstern's restaurant, just around my my neighbor, just around the corner. It's a great place, right? 
Yep, go yeah. ahead. It's Let's a see. small world. Anyway, you know, I've been here for almost, uh, well, I guess more than 20 years now, right? Counting back from 1999. Before I, before I got here, I kicked around in a couple of visiting assistant professorships um, at NYU and Florida Tech and the University of Memphis. And, you know, before that, I got my degree. I originally wanted to go into politics when I was an undergraduate. I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to become a congressional aide. I'm going to, you know, make my mark on politics. And, uh, and I changed my mind after working for a couple of years uh, in politics and decided I wanted to go to graduate school. But, you know, why, I guess more importantly, why am I a political theorist and why do I study ancient Greece, which is kind of a, uh, a fairly narrow choice uh, for a political theorist? Uh, I, that's a harder question to answer. Probably, you know, you'd have to give it a, a discussion of, or I'd have to give an explanation, you know, related to my childhood when, when my grandmother and grandfather used to read to me passages um, from Herodotus and Thucydides about Thermopylae and Leonidas. And I think these settled way deep back in my mind somehow. And, you know, when I got to college, I learned a little Greek. And when I got to graduate school, I thought, oh, that's really what I want to do. The turn to political theory might have also been uh, a reaction against uh, actual politics that I experienced when I was working as a congressional aide for a couple of years. I wanted something distant from that, but still related. So I started to study the Greeks, and here I am now. <laughs> Do you speak fluent Greek? Well, nobody speaks ancient Greek anymore. Um, so uh, I, I can read it. I guess I could struggle to write things out. It wouldn't come, you know, fluidly or naturally. But I read it quite frequently for, for my work. Yeah. Uh, you know, the funny thing, some people still do speak ancient Latin, classical yeah. Latin. Um, some, some priests are trained in classical Latin, sure. and they actually speak it, but nobody does ancient Greek. And it's very different from contemporary Greek. Have you spent time in Greece? I have spent time in Greece. I love Athens done a little bit of excavation work there uh, on archaeological projects when I was at graduate school. And, of course, the beaches are nice, too, so it's double lure, right? intellectual and physical pleasures. My wife, Roselle, and I have spent some real time in Thessaloniki, and that is mm -hmm. a fascinating, wonderful place. Isn't place. it? And you can't dig down two feet without hitting you know, some sort of ruin, something that's interesting. So yes. that's always a lure to go into that sort of thing. So let's go back to New Bolts. <laughs> Who goes to New Bolts mm -hmm. now? Who goes to New Paltz? Well, you know probably that our draw is largely from the, uh, a little bit from the region, but more from the urban area a little bit south of us, a little tiny bit from New Jersey, Long Island, you know, New York City. We get a lot of the kids up uh, here. It's a pretty diverse community. It was diverse interna internationally until Trump got elected and our international cohort has dropped off a little bit. But um, we've got about seven or 8,000 undergraduates here, um, and they're, they're, they're a good bunch of kids. It's a wonderful school to go to. It really is. I mean, you know, I always say go to New Paltz because there the teachers teach the kids. <laughs> what, yeah. I, what I mean by that is in some of the bigger institutions, the teachers teach the graduate <laughs> students and the graduate students teach the kids. And one of the wonderful things about New Paltz is you get the real thing. You do, and you get the real thing in small classrooms. I mean, that's partially – we partially benefit from the from New York State Fire Code, which limits the number of students in classes. We just don't have a lot of classrooms that seat more than 30 or 35 students. So, you know, generally speaking, your classes can be much – I mean, it's not that there are none, but very, very few big lecture halls. So, you know, I'd say my average class is 25, 30 students, which is really fabulous for the, for the SUNY prices, I'll tell you. Does the political science department get along? I say that because there were some times when I was there that we came very close to what you would call a fist fight. Uh, so, uh, let me tell you something, Alan. I, I served as chair um, really? a couple of years ago, and in the political science office, uh, department office, the chair's office, there's a vast bank of filing cabinets, and one of the files actually has your name on it, um, and they have files for almost every other faculty member that's taught here. And you know, when I was a little bit bored in that office, which wasn't often. I had a lot of things to do, but I would go back and page through the history of the political science department at New Paltz, and some of those um, some of those folders were still hot to the touch. I would say, right? They were they were kind of you could see the outlines of old and crusted arguments, people who wouldn't speak with each other for years. But I'm happy to report <laughs> that our department today <laughs> is uh, is is very well off. We all get along well. We're we're a, we're a well functioning department, and. We're actually um, a department where everyone is tenured at this point, so we're kind of a senior department as well. Mm -hmm. And has, has New Paltz undergone some of the stresses of other universities where there aren't enough kids, you know, and, and therefore there's some problems? Well, mostly recently as a, as a result of COVID, right, we've seen some enrollment dips 
especially when we went online and then coming back, the students are starting to come back slowly. We're looking forward to a bigger uh, demographic dip, but I think, you know, relative to the other SUNY schools or a lot of other SUNY schools, not all of them, and relative to a lot of the smaller colleges around, we're really in a good position. Part of it, as you point out, is just the place where we are. New Paltz is beautiful. You've got the mountains right here, access to the Catskills. You can get down to New York City. You can get up to Albany. But you're, you're kind of out in nature. It's a beautiful spot to go to school. I'm looking out my window right now, and I can see up into the Catskills. It's gorgeous. I, couldn't, I could never afford this view on my own, but here I have it in my office. Mm. So it's a beautiful place to be. And, you know, some of the other benefits are just, you know, these very small classes that you talked about, right? I've taught big lecture classes. And, you know, when a student comes to me from a big lecture class a couple of years later and says, I need a recommendation for graduate school, I can say, oh, you know, Joe showed up for class and he was pretty well dressed. But that's probably all I can, that's probably all I could say about it, right? But if you're in one of my small classes, I can say, "Oh, you know, Susan said this, she argued this, she wrote a paper about this, she has these strengths." You can get a much better relationship with your professor and your professor can know who you are in a very very different way. Um and it's you know, quite frankly, it's much more gratifying and pleasurable to teach in that sort of circumstance as well. So it benefits the students, it benefits the faculty. And so in that sense, I think New Paltz is really well positioned, you know, to be competitive. So what's your administration been like? Our administration has been pretty stable for the last couple of years. You might know that we're in the middle of a new presidential search. Our our current president, Don Christian, has announced his retirement. So That's so good. I love that guy. He is a good guy, yeah. He's very stable. I don't mean he's stable mentally, but he's got a stable hold on what's going on in, in the college. And over the last decade... I don't know when the last time you were at New Paltz was, but, wow. you know, yeah, well, since I've been here, the campus has just been changed dramatically. Oh, yeah, lots yeah, of new yeah. buildings have gone up, you know, lots of lots of things, you know, made more beautiful. Um, a lot of the central parking area eliminated and put on the periphery. So it's it's a it's a beautiful campus. And part of that has been, you know, Don's, Don's work in getting grants and funding for these sorts of projects. Um, so hopefully we get as good a president next time. So now you've written this book, Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. I see you're an associate professor, but this will surely push you up into the highest ranks, won't it? Surely push me right over the top. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. We'll see, Alan. Yeah. Sometimes I joke I should I should put my file in before the reviewers come out. <laughs> that, that, that's great. Okay. So as I mentioned before, New Paltz is a place where people come and sometimes they don't leave. And so yeah. there, there are traditional places to eat and places to drink in New Paltz. And I was surprised. I was reading an article the other day. Many of them are still there. Yeah. That's a question. Yeah. Did you go to Snug's Tavern when you were here? No, because I'm not a drinker. Yeah, that's for that's for real serious drinkers. Bob, I think most of the a lot of the restaurants are still here. A lot of the bars are still here. And yep. if they're not here with the same name, they might have the same owners or slightly yeah, different yeah, cuisine. Yeah. You know, Main Street's wonderful. You can kind of walk down and pick your cuisine out. New Paltz is lucky because we have all these tourists that come up from the city. You know, for the, sure. for the outdoor sporting goods, and uh, so we have far better restaurants um, than we would normally merit as a college town. I Thing. It's a nice place to eat. We're in conversation with Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Let me say this, Jeff, if we can, let's go to the book. What is the central theme that you want people to get from that book? The central theme is that our thinking today about democracy, I argue, has become a little bit sclerotic and a little bit limited, right? We think in very narrow terms about what's possible democratically. And so one of the ways one of the ways that I came to write this book was I was thinking about sort of philosophical use of the ancient world, of the classical world. And it, um, if you or your listeners don't know, there's a whole series of 20th century um, political theorists and philosophers who turn to the ancient world um, to recalibrate or rethink some of their philosophical premises or foundations. People like Hannah Arendt or Michel Foucault or on the conservative side, Leo Strauss. And when I read these guys, sometimes I think, well, that's that's really interesting, right? And I'm fascinated with that. It's, it's fun to read. But it was always a bit uh, odd to me that nobody on the political side turned to ancient Athens to draw some lessons out of this real, practical, on-the-ground, real-life example of a, of a really thriving democracy that lasted for about 200 years. So it's been this sort of philosophical resource, but it's never been kind of a real-world political resource. And part of that um, is because there's been a long 
history of prejudice against democratic governments, both in the philosophical tradition and in, you know, sort of more practical political thinking about politics. And that goes right back to the ancient world, because if you, your primary interface, if you went to college and you, you read some classical texts from ancient Athens, you probably read people like Plato and Aristotle, maybe some Thucydides, and these guys are all relatively critical of democracy. You might categorize them as sort of even a little bit oligarchically inclined. So the picture we often get of Athenian democracy is a negative one, and you can see this you know, uh, filter up into real-world political discussions insofar as they refer to the ancient world. Right? If they want to think about the ancient world, they'll think about ancient Rome, Republican Rome, and they'll reject the radical democracy of Athens. Right? It's too too dangerous to trust the people with all that power. People are fickle. They can't uh, consistently pursue a policy. They're too subject to demagogues. Um, you can imagine the complaints. So, you know, when the American founders think about politics, when they're not thinking about politics philosophically, when they're not thinking about Locke, you know, they're thinking about someone from the from the ancient Roman Republic and not democracy. So there's a little bit of prejudice there. Um, but I think over the last hundred years or so, there's been this sort of interest among classicists and ancient historians to move beyond these more traditional anti-democratic philosophical sources to kind of popular sources uh, in Athenian democracy. And we're really lucky, especially from the fourth century BCE, we have this huge corpus of um, huge body of texts that are left over from, from law courts and political speeches that were actually given um, in public, right? And so they weren't aimed at a philosophical or uh, uh, well-educated audience. They're aimed at general public. So we're, we've been in the process of kind of reconstructing what democratic theory might look like were you on the ground, were you an Athenian citizen practicing it at the time. And it's very different um, from the picture you get from philosophical sources. So there's a long way of answering your question. You know, when I think about the 5th and the 4th centuries BCE, this roughly 200-year period of Athenian you know, radical democracy – I see them doing things very differently than the way that we do things, um, and I see them having practices that are different from ours. Um, and I think that – not that we want to take any of these practices and drop them down in the U.S. or in Canada or someplace like that, you know, unadorned or unchanged, but they can be an inspiration to kind of think beyond the boundaries of the way that we consider – uh, the field of the political to exist today. So could you go into some of the practices you just referenced that may differ what we do today and what they did then? Yeah, I can talk about two um, that are they're pretty straightforward and don't require a lot of background to understand. Um, the first uh, most surprising thing, I think, certainly for my students when we, when we talk about ancient Athens, um, is that uh, ancient Athenian Democrats thought that elections were uh, kind of an indication that you were in an oligarchy, right? Even Aristotle says this. He says, you know, one of the signs that you're in an oligarchy is that most offices are given out on the basis of elections. You know, why is this? I think we all kind of intuitively know the answer to that. Certain people win elections, other people don't, and a lot of people can't stand for election. So who wins? Well, the wealthy, the powerful, people with influence, the charismatic, and these people win elections. So elections for Aristotle, for Athenians, were signs of oligarchies. Um, instead of elections, Athens in the 5th and 4th century gave out most of the political or assigned most political offices, almost all political offices, on the basis of a lottery, a sortition, as opposed to an election. So this is a little bit like – well, it's a little bit like the way we, we do jury selection today, where if you just took a phone book, if you still have one, and opened it up and pointed to a name and say, okay, this person is going to be in charge of – you know, whatever civic office you you needed, water and power in Rosendale, we'll put this person in charge for a year, we'll put this person in charge for a year. So it was this really radical, radically different way of distributing and assigning political offices. And it, it meant, of course, that average citizens um, held the majority of offices in Athens, which is just this astonishing difference right, in terms of in terms of how things worked. And you know, for me, I read this and I read the sources of it because, you know, if you read if you read Plato, for example, Plato has Socrates criticize uh, sortition or lottery driven uh, distributions of office quite often in the dialogues. Um, but what's interesting about the Athenian people is they have responses to this and they have arguments and rationales as to why um, you should use a lottery system as opposed to an election to distribute offices. So you can think of a couple of things that uh, that they would say right off the bat. You know, one, they'd say, you know, 
democracies depend on a certain conception of equality. Equality is, is very important. So you need to have equal representation, equal participation. Um, and if there's any one person that gets too much power, that sort of warps the space of democracy around that person. So I'd say we want to distribute offices as broadly as possible. Um, we think um, that average citizens are capable of doing basic political work, making decisions. Um, and, and we also think that distributing offices in this way prevents more common forms of corruption. Um, so the Athenians set up the lottery system to kind of avoid these, uh, these larger problems that might kind of bog a democracy down or shift it into an oligarchy or make it vulnerable to tyrannies. What if we tried that now? Would it work? Well, um, we do it for juries already, yes. um, and I think uh, probably some of you have served on juries. And you might be surprised. I, I know that I was surprised about 10 years ago when I really started to, to look into this. You might be surprised to hear that lots of countries are actually experienced – I'm sorry, not experiencing, but um, experimenting rather um, – with uh, sortition as a way of resolving political impasses. So uh, probably the most notable example that happened recently was last fall. I think it was in November, the city of Paris uh, instituted a permanent citizens' assembly. Um, and this citizens' assembly is a group of individuals, it's about 100 members, who are, uh, who are, uh, who are assigned randomly um, to work on a particular issue. Um, and then they come up with a proposal to fix the issue, and they submit it to the Paris City Council, which then has to consider it. So there, there are some experiments like this. They're mostly in Europe, a little bit in Canada where small cities and sometimes um, major regions, East Belgium is another that's doing this, are experimenting with these groups of people who are selected randomly and given the task of working on something that's that's difficult for the legislature to deal with, right? Difficult because it's very divisive or difficult because the legislature, legislature is subject to uh, – uh, to the influence of big money um, or other sorts of, uh, of lobbyists, and they, they pass it off to these uh, – these, they're called mini-publics or citizens' assemblies. So I guess what I say to that is that you know, it's not like the United States is going to shift over into a sortition or lottery-based uh, political system overnight, but I think we can start thinking about experimenting around the borders with this sort of approach. We're in conversation with Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Professor Miller, let me ask you this. What do you think could happen in this country to bring us closer to the Athenian model? Well, I think, you know, like most things in the United States, you need to start experimenting on the on the local or, uh, or at the biggest on the state level. There's not a lot of room for this um, at the federal level. Um, but I think um, cities, small cities or, or larger cities could actually do this. And, you know, the immediate problem is you run up sort of against constitutional restrictions or you wind up against, uh, you know, uh, some sort of legal impediment to this. But there's nothing there's nothing to prevent, for example, the Rosendale Town Council um, to set up a, a little mini public like this to make some recommendations about a particular issue. Um, they could do it and they could say, you know, we'll take the recommendations and then we'll pass them in the city council or we'll consider them in the city council or we'll amend them in the city council. Um, and then they could do it. So there are certain ways of bypassing maybe the legal requirements of it going through elected offices. Um, and uh, and so, I, you know, I think it would, it would have to start at, 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 at a local or a small level, not, not at the federal level probably, um, although we could probably use it at the federal level. You know, it's interesting that you say this because we have New York State, that's my subject or one of them, and we have uh, New York City. And New York mm -hmm. City is quite progressive compared to New York State. They've set up all Indeed. kinds of what I would consider to be progressive ways of proceeding with, with their government. Now, how does that happen? I mean, how do you achieve change in a place like New York City, but not in upstate New York? Well, part of that is because of the demographics of New York City, right? You have a kind of a left-leaning leaning electorate, and a lot of areas north of the city, it's it's less so. Um, even well, even some boroughs of the city aren't so left-leaning, like Staten Island. So I think you have to have some openness on the part of the citizens to experiment. But I think one of the nice things about turning to the ancient world is a lot of these practices aren't necessarily caught up in the you know, very fractious and bitterly divided political debates that we we see around us today, right? So if you if you make a proposal today on particular piece of legislation it automatically gets categorized as being on the left or on the right, or even if it's on the left or the right, it might be, is it, is it from the Bernie Sanders wing or is it from the moderate wing of the Republic or the Democratic Party? These types of things that come out of the ancient world, they're not 
they're not on our radar. They're not something that slot automatically into one political party's wheelhouse or, or not. So I think there's a certain advantage to them in the sense that they, they come in without that sort of uh, – uh, that, that sort of automatic uh, slotting into a into one political party or another. Well, I'm sure you knew that I would ask you about Donald Trump because I consider him to be one of the most dangerous demagogues that we have ever yeah. seen in this country. Yeah. And I think when you talk about democracy and you talk about Trump, you find a wide difference. Can you talk about that a bit? Sure. Um, that was actually the kind of a lead-in, maybe nice, nice question. Kind of a lead into the other topic I was gonna, I was gonna discuss from ancient Athens, and that, and that is the, the Athenian practice of ostracism. I mean, I, I, I largely agree with your views about Donald Trump, but I think he's, he's an interesting and helpful example in this sense. And let me explain what uh, ostracism was, and then I'll tell you why he's a, he's a helpful example for this. So Athens in the fifth century had this very interesting uh, uh, practice called ostracism, and, and you, you know the term. You can ostracize someone sure. today. That means not talking with them or kind of pushing away. But for the Athenians, it's an actual political practice. It's an institution, right? And the term comes from the Greek word ostraka or ostrakon, which is a little piece of pottery, a broken piece of pottery. So an ostracism in Athens was something that happened annually, or it could happen annually. Every spring, the Athenians get, would gather together and they'd have a vote as to whether or not they wanted to hold an ostracism or not. So all citizens could vote. If the threshold for an ostracism was met, then they'd meet again about a month later and they'd actually hold the ostracism. What this means was you as an average Athenian citizen would go around, you'd scrounge on the ground, you'd pick up the pottery shard. Most goods were transported in pots, so there are lots of pieces around in Athens. And on that pottery shard, you would scratch the name of someone that you thought was dangerous to the polity. You count up the votes, and the winner, or the loser in this case, had to leave Athens for a period of 10 years. Uh, he wasn't penalized otherwise. He didn't lose his property. His family didn't have to leave. He didn't even technically lose his citizenship. He could come back after that 10 years, but he had to leave for 10 years. So this is a practice that happened off and on throughout the 5th century. Not every year had an ostracism. And you know, as, in with, as with all of these things, our records for this period are, are, are pretty fragmentary, so we have to reconstruct a lot. But one of the things we can, we can see in the sources that discuss ostracism is the Athenians are saying, hey, some people, um, some members of a, of a democracy may not have done anything illegal. They may not have done anything technically wrong, but nonetheless, they're dangerous for their democracy. They, they warp that democratic space because of their power, because of their money, because of their ability to influence people. Um, and and, and they shift this sense of equality that the Athenians thought were so important. So the Athenians would say, well, you know, sorry, you haven't done anything wrong, but you're dangerous. You're making this an anti-democratic space, and we're worried that you're going to cause maybe actual violence, or we're worried that you know a tyranny is going to arise out of this, so you need to leave for 10 years. You can come back. Now, yeah. interestingly, the Athenians did this, and sometimes people came back. There's one, one, one fellow, a guy named Megacles. His name actually means in ancient Greek, great fame, so you can kind of get a picture of what he must have thought of himself, was ostracized, and he came back, and then he was ostracized again. He must have been a real winner. Anyway, so the Athenians had this mechanism to deal with problems that weren't necessarily technical legal violations, but problems that were related to, to individual power and how that was kind of anti-democratic in and of itself. And I think that's that's really important, um, and probably one of the reasons that Athens was able to stabilize itself. Athens shifts to a democracy from a tyrannical and oligarchical form of government in the sixth century into a into this radical democracy. Probably one of the reasons it was able to stabilize itself. One of the reasons was this practice of ostracism, where you could just kind of get rid of someone who was dangerous in this sort of way. So we don't have anything like that in the United States. Um, um, nothing formal, anyway. But I, you know, you, I remember probably like you remember um, in the days leading up to Joe Biden's election last year, um, there was all this talk about what Donald Trump was doing and what he was plotting um, and what he was planning to do. And and Donald Trump had this tremendous megaphone. He was on Twitter every day tweeting things out, right? Um, and sometime I can't remember the exact date. Maybe you remember sometime in early January, Twitter deplatformed him. Do you remember that? Uh, yes. 
Yeah, this, yeah. You, can't, you, can no longer, you can no longer tweet, right? Now, this seems like – it seems almost like a joke. You can't tweet anymore. But if you remember, the right. political temperature in the country dropped precipitously immediately, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, that might have been one of the reasons why Joe Biden's inauguration was able to go off without violence, without other problems, um, and why we could actually transition power safely. Who knows what he would have said if he was on Twitter and what he would have been able to do. So – this isn't an ostracism, um, but it is a sort of a, an absence of him from the political sphere. And that probably is, has more to do with Donald Trump. You know, Twitter was his only way of reaching out to his people. A more skillful politician could probably reach them in other ways, and I'm sure he's working on ways around that today. But I think we need some sort of way of kind of taking people out of the discourse temporarily. Now, how to do this is tricky with free speech uh, protections that we have in the United States today, um, but you can definitely see the benefit from from having it having it occur there. So, I, you know, people often complain about cancel culture and they complain about you know free speech being uh, under threat. You know, the, the stuff about Joe Rogan in the last month, right? How, is he going to get kicked off of his various platforms or not? I think these are healthy conversations to have. So, um, I, I would be wary about restricting free speech across the board, and I would be wary about the government coming up with any sort of formal criteria uh, for uh, restricting speech in this sort of way. But I'm in favor of debates. I'm in favor of thinking about it. We need to kind of move some people out away from the center of political discourse when they have the sort of disproportionate power, um, and especially when they're using it malignly um, in the way that, uh, that Trump has been. Fascinating. Just fascinating. We are talking with Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Were they smarter in Athens than we are as a country now? No, they weren't smarter in Athens than we are as a country now. Um, but they had more faith in the average citizen, and they, uh, and they made the average citizen do more um, in terms of their civic work and civic responsibilities. So um, you can imagine this a little bit, right, uh, from the time that you're, you're very young as an Athenian citizen. In, um, you're, you're brought up in your family and you're introduced into your, your local community as a citizen, and you immediately start to get responsibilities um, and privileges um, as a result of being a citizen. So there's kind of an expectation that you're going to go out and you're going you're to take your turn serving on these various boards, that you're going to go to assembly meetings, that eventually you serve on the, the, uh, something called the Boule, an executive council uh, that set agendas for uh, assembly meetings. There is an expectation that you'd serve in the military um, if you were able body. So there's all these sort of duties that came along with being citizens, and, and of course you're instantly enmeshed in the political world from the time that you're a late adolescent. Now, I think some of my thinking about this book actually comes from a book that I read a long time ago. I'm sure you know it. It's a book that was published in 2000 by Robert Putnam, um, Bowling Alone. Mm -hmm. Have you read that book? I'm sure you know it. Mm -hmm. Um, Putnam's premise, if you don't know the text, it's, it's a great read, still very interesting if you want to get a copy of it. Putnam's premise is that you know, bowling leagues have, have disappeared. He, he surveys civic and cultural life in the United States in the 20th century following World War II. And he said, if you go back to 1960, everybody's in the bowling league, everybody's in the Elks Club, you know, whatever, everyone's a Shriner or a Mason. Um, and then you fast forward to the late 90s, 2000, and bowling leagues are gone. People are bowling alone, or today they're not bowling alone. They're staying home, right? They're watching Netflix. They're ordering food in. I think this has been kind of an, a problem that's been uh, amplified by COVID, of course, right? We're, we're very isolated from one another. We have none of these kind of civic mechanisms that bring us together in non-political situations and settings where we can kind of interact with our neighbors. It's striking, Right. And this plays out um, in, for, in, in terms of individual uh, al senses of alienation, sense of isolation, some mental illnesses may be related to it, the forms of depression. It's very difficult um, uh, to, to kind of find civic spaces, especially today, but even before COVID, to find civic spaces where you could interact with other people. Um, uh, and uh, and, and that's, that's a real problem. And there's a sense of community that's lost with that. So. I think that uh, I think that Athens is a good counterexample to this, just in the sense that it's such a dense civic life. Not only these kind of political uh, political offices that people hold, political activities that they engage in, um, military activities that they engage in, but also you know, there's sort of a, 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 an equally dense festival network in Athens. There, there, there are very few days on the Athenian calendar where it's not some sort of 
some sort of feast day or some sort of special festival where Athenians come together to celebrate things. And this bringing people together, not to talk about politics, but, you know, maybe to worship a god or maybe to uh, celebrate a particular day in the year. Um, these have a way of kind of bridging differences. I, I don't know about you, Ellen, but I, you know, I'm a professor at, at New Paltz and I talk with my colleagues. And we all we all think the same thing politically, right? I would be hard pressed. It would be hard pressed to name a Republican on the faculty here at New Paltz, right? I'm sure there are some, but I would be hard pressed to come up with them, right? So we all kind of occupy, to the extent that we do socialize, we we we, we socialize and interact with the people that already share our own opinions, right? Mm. So Athens, I think, and one of the chapter is chapters is on sort of these civic networks. Athens is an example of a very big city, right, where these sort of civic networks are supported, amplified, paid for, right, by the citizen body, and they, they bring people together. And that's, I think, really important. We're talking to Professor Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz. Jeff, I have a question for you. Yeah. Certainly in this country, we have what I would yeah. call a political class. You know, these are the people who run for political offices, who know how to work the levers of power. Is this the same thing that if you were walking around in ancient Athens, you would have seen? To a certain extent, but not not in the same sort of way. So there are, you know, if you're thinking about the Athenian Assembly, um, where theoretically mm -hmm. anybody could get up and, and give a speech and, and have their say, you know, an Athenian Assembly, there's roughly 6,000 people at an assembly meeting, right? And these assemblies, they, they met uh, probably about 200 times a year. So often there's an assembly meeting. Um, and if you've ever, I mean, I try to speak in front of 35 students and I struggle to make myself heard, right? You can imagine what speaking in front of 6,000 people is like. And they're not always necessarily the, the quietest bunch, right? Even if they're trying to be quiet, it's noisy. You've got to be able to project. You've got to be clear. This is a very difficult thing to do. So I think in practice, at Athenian assembly meetings, anybody could speak, and sometimes anybody did speak. In reality, there were a set number of people who were prepared to do this, who had the skills and the lungs right, to be able to project and be heard authoritatively over this sort of crowd. So in that sense, there is this small group of orators um, who – can kind of move or set the agenda in assembly debates. But in so many other areas of life, it really is an average Athenian citizen. So one of the really curious things about Athens in the classical period, the fifth and the fourth century, is Athens has no police force that we would recognize, no permanent bureaucracy that we would recognize. Now, Athens did have this very, very small number of, uh, of police officers, what would look like kind of police officers, but they were slaves. It was about 25, 30, sometimes 50 of them right, for a huge city, so basically no police force. And this was uh, a force that was exclusively used by the executive council, so it was even fairly limited in that sense. Instead, Athens was governed by these boards of citizens. So I said before, you know, all these offices are given out on the basis of a lottery. That's true, but you weren't put in charge of things by yourself. So if I was in charge of the water system at Rosendale, for example, I was selected for that. I would be selected with probably 10 other people to oversee this water board. And of those 10 people, maybe one of them would have served before. Three or four of them would have connections with other people on different boards. Other people would be older and more experienced than me. And if I didn't know anything or if I was kind of really lazy and wasn't doing my work, I, someone else would, would step in and do it or they'd, they'd get me to step in and do it. So – Anything that happened in Athens happened not because of some police action or not because of some sort of bureaucratic uh, incentives. It happened because individual citizens went out and actually did it. If the Athenian Assembly said, hey, we're going we're gonna to have a festival you know, in two months, it wasn't like there was a bureaucracy they could hand the job off to. They were really handing the job to themselves. So on the one hand, speaking in the Assembly, there is this sort of set of, of orators – um, that kind of lead things decisively, but when it comes to implementations, it's, it's, it's average Athenian citizens that are doing that. Um, there's one other group of individuals in Athens that uh, were decided on the basis of election, and those were generals. There were 10 generals elected every year. Um, they also tended to be these the sorts of people that could stand up in front of the assembly and speak really well. So they had kind of quasi-executive sort of offices in Athens. Um, but generally speaking, authority is dispersed very broadly, very generally. 
And, you know, over the course of your life, an average Athenian citizen would, would serve on these boards a number of different times. Um, in fact, probably one of the most interesting things I think about the 5th century is that there was an executive council that set the agenda for assembly meetings. And this executive council was made up of a group of people broadly drawn from Athenian society, the entire uh, Athenian society outside of the city of Athens itself. And that executive council, this called, thing called the boule, was headed every day by one individual who was randomly selected. This, this person would be effectively the head of state for the day, mostly an administrative position. You, know, you couldn't pass legislation on your own, but you could do a little of agenda setting. And what, there's one classical uh, historian, Moen's Herman Hansen, who does some rough calculations on the back of an envelope and says that in the fourth century, one quarter of the citizens of Athens over the course of their lives would have served as head of state for one day. That position rotated day after day, right? That's kind of astonishing, right? One person is president, you know, <laughs> for a day and then shifted out for another one and one quarter of the citizens do that. So that sort of, that sort of grant of authority and confidence in the individual, right, on the one hand is, is astonishing, but it's also astonishing in the sense that individuals in these sort of circumstances seem to have been basically competent to be able to do it. And, you know, they weren't super well educated, certainly by modern standards. We think, you know, literacy was fairly widespread in Athens but it's not like they were taking advanced math courses or engineering courses. Our citizen body is, is far more educated than them. So in answer to your question, long answer, right? They're not better educated. They're not better off than us, but they're, they're better prepared. They're mentally prepared, and they have, a, they have a sense of civic duty. Okay, let's talk a little bit about something that is ancillary to what you've been talking about, and that yeah, is okay. term limits. Think about that. Yeah. It's all switched around in Athens. You yeah. had a chance. You were the leader. You weren't the leader. Yeah. But in this country, forget it. There's this professional class of politicians, and they're not giving up on power if they can possibly avoid it. In New York City, which I referenced before, yeah. they've tried to deal with that. You know, they say, okay, we're going to say there's a limit on how long you can hold a political office. So the question for you, Jeff, is whether or not they had an idea in Athens that if you were in office too long, you could be dangerous. Sure. I mean, you could be dangerous even if you're trying to do the right thing, even if you're a pretty good guy, right? So from the Athenian perspective, let, let's say let's say you're doing everything right legislatively, whatever, whatever you imagine that to be, bureaucratically, whatever you imagine that to be. But if you're in office for multiple years or a decade or multiple decades, as is the case in New York, right, power accumulates around you, accretes around you. You have a real disproportionate share of the political pie. Right off the face of it, even if you're doing everything well, for the Athenians, this is objectionable, right, because it diminishes the power uh, uh, of other people that are around you. So right off the bat, there's a problem. But as you point out, there's often also a problem of corruption that goes along with that. We know this story really well in New York State. Um, so the Athenians were very worried about both of these things, maintaining relative equality amongst the citizens and shutting down possibilities for corruption. So all of these offices I'm talking about, typically they only ran for a year. You served for a year. If you were on the executive council, the boule, you served for a year. If you're on one of these boards, you served for a year. Um, you know, you can, for most of the offices, not all of them, you can put your name in the hopper again, um, but because these offices are given out on the basis of lottery, there's no guarantee that you'll get the same position, um, no guarantee that you get another position at all, uh, at least not when you think about it. So this uh, this fact that you you only serve these limited durations, both make sure that power gets spread out pretty broadly across the polity, but it also makes um, the kind of uh, institutional power that comes with holding an office for a long time impossible to develop. Um, it makes things like bribery or corruption a little tricky to do. It's not that you can't do it at all, but it's it's made more difficult by the transient nature of people that are on these boards. The fact that it's not one person, but a group of people governing or determining you know, any particular bureaucratic office also means it's difficult to do that, difficult to, to bribe or corrupt. Uh, you'd have to corrupt all of them. And, and then the Athenians also had this practice of uh, they called it a, uh, an examination. They'd have an examination before you took the, the seat and an examination at the end, euthanize the Greek term for it. So yeah. I serve um, on the Rosendale Board of Water, for example, in ancient Greece. Um, at the end of my time, I step down and I appear before a board for one day. And anybody who has any problem with what I did over the course of the year, they can come and lodge a formal complaint against me. And if they're you know, substantiated, then there could be a court case about it, right? So there's this sort of attempt not just to kind of limit things on the basis of term limits, but also 
ask, actually ask, did this person do a good job? Was there any corruption? Is there a problem? Did he, you know, make decisions that favored his family or his friends or his relatives? And if these are the case, then I would be, I would be legally liable for these sorts of things. So Athens was very, very clear about this. And I, I you know, it's just, it's kind of astonishing to me, the, 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 the depth of participation. Um, this applies, uh, Probably most, well, I'll tell you one of the most interesting things that I found um, in thinking about this. So there, there's a there's a machine in Athens, kind of weird to call it a machine. It's a big stone uh, tablet, and it has all of these slots in it. And each individual citizen who wants to have a, a jury slot or wants to have a position in, in, in Athens has a little tab. A little, it's like a little card, maybe two by three inches. Uh, they used to be made out of brass. Some of them were made out of wood. Sorry, copper. Some of them made out of wood, and on the on the tag would be their name um, and where they lived. It's kind of their address, right? Um, and you would put this tag into the machine. The machine is called a clepsydria, clepsydria, um, and it was there was a way of randomly selecting people out of this this machine. When we look at grave sites in classical Athens in the fifth and fourth century, not a lot of these around, but to the extent that we find them, guess what people take to the grave with them and are buried with. Well, they're, they're buried with these little identification tabs that indicate who they are as a citizen and represent their civic service. The amount of pride that Athenians took in this, you know, this is, this is something they wanted with them <laughs> in the afterlife. It's kind of astonishing that they would do this. I want to remind everybody we're talking to Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. Okay, Jeff Miller, here's your chance. So what, right. in, <laughs> so what in fact, is the lesson that we have learned from the ancient Greeks that we are not employing now, but that we ought to. Well, if you if you ask someone today, what do they think it means to be in a democracy? Right? Um, they're gonna. They're almost certainly they'll say elections. Elections are the most important democratic mechanism. And uh, you know this this I think is 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 true. It is important to have elections, right? Um, but it also obscures a whole range of possibilities. I um, mean, it also obscures the real problems I think that electoral politics hand us, right? We're familiar with them, I think. I don't need to go through a list of the problems um, that electoral mm -hmm. democracy gives to us, right? There's a reason the Senate is filled with uh, guys that look like me who have a lot more money than I do, right? They're, that's the result of electoral politics. So on the one hand, it's sort of a, it's sort of a mistake to identify this as the most important democratic mechanism. All of these sort of sub-state level activities, all of the sort of subsidiary levels of uh, of engagement, civic engagement, right, that the Athenians thought were so very important are kind of ignored by us today. Right? So to, to think about, to reduce being a democratic citizen to that one day every two years, every four years when there's an election, not just that one day, that one hour when you go to the, to the polling place, if you even bother to go and say that that's democracy, that seems really impoverished to me. So I think, you know, the, the point here that I want to get people to think about is to, is to think beyond the elections, not that we're going to be able to replace elections or get rid of them, but there are other ways of doing democracy. Athens was incredibly stable over 200 years, right? This democracy actually just became, actually, if you're kind of measuring it, it arguably became more radical over time, right? More democratic, more egalitarian over time. And, you know, a common critique about democracies is that they're, they're unable to manage their affairs. They're vulnerable to being uh, destabilized by, uh, by tyrants. Um, but Athens, a democracy in Athens didn't end because a tyrant took over. A democracy in Athens end because, ended because of Alexander the Great and his father Philip II and the, the Macedonian Empire. It, it ended as a result of military conquest, right? not because of the democracy dissolved. In fact, even after Philip II, Alexander the Great's father, and Alexander take over Athens, um, democracy, the Athenians try to restart democracy several times over the ensuing decades. It never kind of takes again because of external pressures. But internally, it was quite solid. So here you have this incredibly stable regime that became more democratic over the course of 200 years, and they have – some ideas for us to, to think about, to pursue, um, both in terms of developing senses of community, in terms of in terms of ostracism, right? In terms of sortition, in terms of fully utilizing kind of the strengths 
of people that are out there. That's what I, that's right. That's, that's the lesson I think we can learn from ancient Athens. Now, Jeff Miller, let me ask you this. Let's bring it up to a contemporary sort of focus. Now you have Andrew Cuomo, somebody yeah. I know fairly well. And in the comeback, I hear. I had predicted that quite a while ago, and now people, I remember. people who should know better are saying they're coming yeah. up with that idea, you know, now for the first time. And go away. Okay, now listen here. So Cuomo is one of the most popular men in America for a while. He's the anti-Trump. He goes on every day. He tells everybody what's really going on with COVID, and people love him. And then all of yeah. a sudden, he's done. Stick a fork in him, as a publisher once said to me. He's over. So I'm going to ask you this. How can we explain this in terms of Athens, in terms of ancient Athens? And what happened? Were there those leaders who emerged and who suffered the same way that Cuomo has? Sure. Um, I think you can think of a lot of examples of political authorities in Athens that lost uh, their prestige pretty quickly, sometimes dramatically. Sometimes we might think reasonably, other times not so much. Themistocles, um, uh, one of the famous uh, Athenian politicians and generals from the early part of the 5th century, who was deeply involved in repelling Persian invasions, wound up being ostracized. Um, Pericles, the very famous uh, late 5th century, well, I guess mid, uh, mid-5th mid century uh, general and politician who's largely responsible, if you go to Athens today, you go up on the Acropolis, all those buildings up there, they're more or less arranged by Pericles. Um, he was uh, constantly sued. He was removed from office several times, uh, sued, um, was in danger of being ostracized himself. He never was. Um, so the Athenians could, 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 of course, turn on a dime. Um, but I would argue most of the time it wasn't turning on a dime for no good reason. It was turning on a dime and changing their opinion of them because of evidence that came out, much in the same way as Andrew Cuomo. Um, and I think, you know, Cuomo is a good example, as many Albany politicians are, of someone who is in office for a long time and, and, and felt fairly cavalier about what they could do with their power and their influence. And uh, not just at a personal level, the, the sexual peccadilloes, right, but just in the sense of the sort of perks and benefits he could give out to his friends and families and supporters. So this is, this is a problem that's attached to long-term duration in office. And I suspect that most of us might be might be vulnerable to it mm. um, if we were we were similarly exposed to this sort of. I, I wish I could say that I would be you know as pure as the driven snow if I held yeah. a, uh, a Senate seat in Albany for thirty years, but I'm I'm not sure. You know, maybe not. Now his father was very famous. Yeah. How about that kind of thing? You know, in ancient Athens. I mean, to what point? To, sure. To what point? Sure. Somebody, you could be famous, yeah. and you, you you could be famous, and you could have power and influence. You know, the ostracism happened every year, but it was only one person that was ostracized. That's a, that's kind of a just one individual out of a out of a much larger civic body. Athens in the mid fifth and fourth century, the number of citizens you're you're thinking about roughly three hundred thousand people. So that's just one out of that group. Um, I think something like ostracism function not so much as a uh, a mechanism you could count on to eliminate someone who you thought was dangerous with any degree of precision, but it functioned more sort of as a warning. Like if you are in this upper tier of politicians, if you have money, if you have influence, if you have power, this could happen to you um, if you overstep your bounds. One of the really interesting things about the, um, the ostraca, the uh, little pottery shirts that you can look at, is they often have the, the name of the person, and they'll often uh, actually also include an epithet, or it'll be in a particular case, like the dative case, which indicates that you know there is some other series of words attached to the name. So, you know, I, I throw this shard with Pericles' name on the ground, or I curse Pericles, right? It would be something like this. Um, so... Uh, one interesting set of these has to do with sort of the flaunting of wealth and the flaunting of power. So it might be someone like, you know, uh, uh, let's let's ostracize Pericles and his horses. Horses were a sign of great wealth during this time period, right? So, you know, sort of even even ostentatious displays of wealth um, could draw the ire of citizens. Again, not because there's anything illegal about it but because it marks the distinction between you and that person as being one that's marked by money or one that's marked by power, and it diminishes um, the person who doesn't have power or doesn't have money. So it's kind of fundamentally egalitarian impulse. So I guess, I guess in, terms of, in terms of these sorts of penalties, in terms of being deplatformed, right, for example, from uh, Twitter or uh, whatever other 
uh, service you're on, um, it's not so much that it will necessarily happen to you with any degree of certainty, but that it could happen to you. So you need to be a bit more careful about how you use your power, how you speak, how you refer to other people. I, I think these are all kind of salutary things, salutary lessons for us to talk about and think about. And if you're in that group of people that have those sorts of pl- platforms for, for you to think about um, when, you're, when you're actually exercising your speech or your power. I'm sure you are aware, of course, of my hero, Pete Seeger. And, I do. And his classic song, Abby Yo-Yo. What you may not remember is that Abby Yo-Yo was ostracized. <laughs> <laughs> he was ostracized by the people of the town because he was starting up and threatening yeah. people and grown men fainting and women and all the rest of that stuff. Yeah. And I keep thinking of that. And, and Pete goes on to explain what ostracism is all about. So you might want to play that for your class. <laughs> I could I could use that as the intro. I'm giving a talk here at uh, at New Paltz, so I can I can oh, use great. that as the as the background music as I come in. <laughs> It'd be kind of fun. I'd, I'd forgotten about that song. I think I can kind of remember it. Yeah, and, and there it was. So now we have public radio, of course, and you're on it right now. And it's you know a lot of people listen to it. Was there anything similar celebrated by the by the ancient Greeks? Sure. Uh, public radio is a, is a good but attenuated and, and faint echo of the sort of things that uh, ancient Greeks had. So um, I think, you know, the people you, you probably know your dem- I'm sure you know your demographic better than I know your demographic. But I would imagine your demographic for WAMC um, uh, kind of fits a particular mold. It's not oh, the only sure. people that listen to you. Right. But it's a particular type of person. Right. So it's kind of a silo here of people that, that talk to and you listen to. Um, on WAMC. So Athens, though, had this really dense network of different civic associations to which people could go. I, I think one of, the, one of the most interesting things I think about Athenian democracy is all of these high-level Athenian practices, these governmental practices in the central city of Athens, they were duplicated all through the larger area of Athens. Athens is in the territory that Athens immediately controlled. is called Attica. It's about the size of Rhode Island today, so it's a pretty big area geographically. Um, and so there are all these kind of outlying villages, deems, they call them, little city centers that are outside. And each one of these little city centers mimicked the major methods of sortition, distrib- distribution of offices, right? Uh, they had little deem assemblies. All these civic institutions that were done at the grand scale in the city of Athens were duplicated at a small level in those cities. And all of the festivals in Athens that were celebrated at a large scale were often duplicated at a small level as well. So you can think about the major, the most major uh, civic festival in Athens every year was the City Dionysia, the Festival of Dionysus. This is a theater festival. So if you know uh, famous Athenian Greek tragedies like uh, plays by Sophocles, uh, Oedipus, uh, the Antigone, things like this, um, these were plays that were actually performed in front of the Athenian citizens, in front of massive audiences. Um, I, use, I like to tell my students that in democratic Athens, you know, the most democratic institution was actually not the government, but it was this uh, this civic institution of the city Dionysia. Because, you know, to participate in the government, you had to be a citizen. Of course, you had to be male. Of course, you had to be an Athenian. So it's restrictive in that sense. Well, Jeff Miller, I can't believe it, and I could go on for another hour, maybe an hour and a half. We're out of time. We've been in a conversation. Oh, I could go on for a long time, Alan. (laughs) We've been in conversation with Dr. Jeff Miller, Associate Professor of Political Science at SUNY New Paltz and author of Democracy in Crisis, Lessons from Ancient Athens. I advise you all to go pick it up. Again, Jeff Miller, thank you so much for spending this time. Well, thanks very much. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. You've been listening to Dr. Alan Chartok, President and CEO of WAMC Northeast Public Radio and Professor Emeritus at the University at Albany. For more information on WAMC's In Conversation with Alan series or to order a physical copy, call 1-800-323-9262 or subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or on the Google Play Store.